I th thank you very much for your patience as we coordinated getting the uh, individuals that are on this particular panel. This panel is uh, entitled Veterinarians Treating Horses, Views on Furosemide. Uh, on the panel today, we have uh, uh, Leia? Jeff, Dr. Jeff Blea, who is a partner in the veterinary firm of Von Blucher, Blea, Hunkin in Sierra Madre, California, which con he concentrates his practice on muscular skeletal issues and lameness diagnosis. Following veterinary school, Dr. Blea cared for quarter horses and thoroughbreds at Sunland and Rio Doso Downs before moving his practice to Southern California. There, his veterinary practice has served Santa Anita, Hollywood Park, Del Mar, and Pomona racetracks. Dr. Blea is the immediate past president of the American Association of Equine Practitioners. Dr. Gregory Ferraro is a senior advisor to the University of California Davis Center for Equine Health. He formerly served as both its director and as an associate director of the UCAL Davis Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital Large Animal Clinic. Prior to his many years of service to UCAL Davis, he spent 27 years as a racetrack veterinarian and orthopedic surgeon. As a racehorse surgeon, he was amongst the first to adapt to the use of the fiber optic endoscope for respiratory diagnoses. Dr. Scott Hay graduated from the Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine in 1988 and promptly joined Teagland, Franklin, and Brocken, a practice that specializes in the treatment of racehorses. In 1980, he became a full partner in the practice, and since 2004, he has served as its president and managing partner. Dr. Hay presently serves as chairman of the American Association of Equine Practitioners Racing Committee and sits on the AAEP's Professional Ethics and Conduct Committee. Foster... Northrup is an equine veterinarian practicing primarily on thoroughbred racehorses at Churchill Downs, Keeneland, and Palm Meadows. Dr. Northrup got his start in the equine industry in 1989, working primarily on standard bred horses and show horses in Florida. In 2008, he was appointed by the governor of Kentucky to the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission, where he still serves. Dr. Northrup also serves as the vice chairman of the Racing Committee for the American Association of Equine Practitioners. Dr. Gary Priest has spent decades working in the equine industry, first as an ambulatory veterinarian and later as an equine surgeon. In 1985, he assisted in establishing Heart Hill and Priest Equine Surgery. While his late partner, Dr. Alex Heart Hill, has been credited by many with popularizing the use of Lasix in the treatment of EIPH, Dr. Priest has recently become very outspoken about the use, present use of Lasix by racetrack veterinarians. And finally on this panel is Dr. Christopher Higgins, Riggs, excuse me, uh, who presently serves as the head of the Department of Veterinary Clinical Services at the Hong Kong Jockey Club, a position that he has held since January of 2003. Dr. Riggs came to the Hong Kong Jockey Club with a strong academic and clinical research background and extensive experience at a clinical practice at one of Australia's most renowned veterinary hospitals. Dr. Riggs qualified as a veterinary surgeon at the University of Bristol and completed his PhD at the Royal Veterinary College in London. Panelists, commissioners. Well, back again. Welcome to the veterinary panel. And uh, I'd like to start out by saying that nearly 40 years ago, one of my mentors, a Kentucky veterinarian by the name of Gary Lavin, told me that one of the ethical challenges of our profession is that sometimes what is good for the horse may not be good for the industry. Veterinarians and horsemen confront this challenge on a daily basis. In 2008, the American Association of Equine Practitioners, a professional organization of over 10,000 members, published a white paper entitled, Putting the Horse First. The title of that document speaks for itself. One of the fundamental tenets of that position statement is that what's good for the horse must be good for racing. There really is no alternative. And, but, but who decides what is really best for the racing horse? 
how do we define that? Fundamentally, exercise induced pulmonary hemorrhage is a medical issue. However, is this a question that can be answered by science alone, or are there ethical implications, and is, does the, the business model of horse racing play a role in a legitimate discussion of how we should regulate the use of this drug in the sport? We are privileged today to have six very prominent veterinarians from around the world to address these issues. And uh, in, on the screen in front of you, you see Dr. Riggs. And Chris, in sincere and deep appreciation for the fact that it is about, uh, uh, let's see, it would be about 10 minutes to 12 midnight at where you are right now, I'd like you to go first. Oh, well, thank you very much. <clears throat> well, thank you uh, for the invitation to contribute to this forum. It's a great honor to be invited. Uh, and I appreciate that it is indeed a, a difficult and very sensitive issue. Um, and obviously what goes on in a different jurisdiction is often very different in very many ways to another. And all I can do is share some of us experience in Hong Kong, um, which may or may not be helpful in understanding some of the uh, different approach to things where Lasix is not permitted. Um, I think it uh, may be useful just to give you a, uh, the rest of the panel um, and anyone listening a brief background to the model of operation in Hong Kong. It is rather unusual in that it's um, such a closed, confined model. Um, everything is under the control of the Hong Kong Jockey Club. The club owns the facilities. Trainers and jockeys are licensed by the club. Horses are privately owned, but owners have to be members of the club, and they have to have a permit from the club to import the horse. All the horses are imported from overseas. The majority of them come from Australasia, although we also get a lot from Europe. We get some from North and South America. Um, the vast majority of our horses are males, and the average age of import is about three years, and then there's a compulsory retirement age of 10 years. All the horses train in the same uh, training center at Sha Tin, uh, and everything is very tightly controlled in that environment. All the trainers, uh, there are 24 trainers, each has their own stable block, all stables are air-conditioned, and all the trainers share the same training facilities, which is basically a sand trotting ring, all-weather training tracks, which are classic American dirt tracks, a turf track, we've got a poly, poly track, tra hacking trail, and a swimming pool. Uh, our racing season extends from early September to mid-July, and we're limited to only 83 race meetings a year, so that's roughly two a week. Um, and the races are held at, at two race courses, one in Happy Valley and one at Sha Tin. There are, we have um, 769 races a year, which equates to about 9,600 starters. Um, the veterinary services to all horses at the Hong Kong Jockey Club are provided by the Department of Veterinary Clinical Services, and trainers are obliged to use services provided by us. They, are, they have a right to seek a second opinion, and obviously we support that if they would like to do so, but that really happens. Uh, we allocate vets to different trainers to build up continuity and relationships with them, and we have a, an excellent data reporting system. So uh, also in, in Hong Kong legally, only vets are allowed to prescribe and administer medications apart from oral pastes, which uh, trainers or their assistants can do. Uh, we, so therefore, all veterinary or clinical information is diligently recorded in an information system maintained by the department, and all the employees of the club, including the vets, are strictly required to record all relevant information in a detailed, uh, a prompt, and thorough manner. Um, the department also provides clinical cover at race meetings. We also have a separate and independent 
regulatory veterinary department and they perform a pre-race veterinary inspection on every entry the day before it races. They undertake regulatory functions at race meetings and also they conduct post-race veterinary inspections on horses that are referred to them by stipendary stewards. So if a horse performs below expectation, the horse may be referred to them and that part of that examination will include or inspection will include a video endoscopic or a fiber endoscopic examination. Horses that come onto their radar may then be subject to a follow-up examination which is categorized as either a to-watch requirement which is a relatively lesser requirement where um, there has to be demonstration that a clinical vet has attended the horse and dealt with the issue or if it's a more serious condition they have a, an official veterinary examination imposed upon them and the horse has to pass inspection by a regulatory vet when it's seen to gallop and examined afterwards before it's allowed to race again. The Hong Kong Jockey Club is a full signatory to Article 6 of the International Agreement on Breeding and Racing of the IFHA, which means that all horses must race completely free of prohibited substances. And we do have a very thorough screening program in place for prohibited substances. All declared starters have a urine sample collected early morning on the day of racing, and that's analyzed for common, likely medications before the start time for that horse that day. All first and second place horses have blood and urine collected immediately after racing, all beaten favorite, and, and any that didn't provide a urine sample in the morning will also be sampled after the race. All medicines are prescribed, as I mentioned already, by vets from the Department of Veterinary Clinical Services, and we have very strict recommended withdrawal periods, which we're all familiar with and we adhere to. Lasix, furosemide, is not permitted in racing or training. So just very briefly, to finish our experience with EIPH, we have a very thorough screening system in terms of performing endoscopic examinations. There is some trainer variability, but the majority of our trainers request endoscopic examinations on a very regular basis. We have a strict grading system, which is common to that used by the majority of other people globally. And we have that printed as posters around the clinic in prominent areas to encourage consistency in reporting between different individuals. Trainers must report all cases of epistaxis bleeding from the nostrils to stipendary stewards. And if they fail to do so, and it, it has been reported by someone else, then the trainer will survey, face severe penalties. Whenever a horse is scoped by a veterinarian, that veterinarian is obliged to document the information promptly. And we have a pro forma on our electronic database system to record that information, and that's then distributed immediately to the trainer, and also it goes to the regulatory vets as well. So we have very good data on the total number of horses that bleed from the nostrils in training, as well as in racing, um, and also a lot of information on EIPH of lesser grades, in other words, where it doesn't come from the nostrils from endoscopic examination. There are regulatory consequences in our jurisdiction for horses that bleed from the nose. For the first bleeder, horses are, are, are forced to rest, so they can't use the tracks or swimming pool for four weeks. So they're forced to rest for four weeks, and they can't, the trainer can't submit the horse to undertake the official veterinary examination for 10 weeks. So it effectively means it's banned from racing for at least 12 weeks. And the same applies for a second bleed. And then if a horse bleeds a third time, it is compulsorily retired. Also, horses that are documented with significant EIPH on endoscopic examination, in other words, graded three 
or four are also forced to stand down for a while, or at least they have to undertake an OVE examination, and that will not be accepted. The horse will not be accepted for examination within a two-week period, and it can't be entered to race while it has an outstanding OVE. So just lastly, to give you some of our data, 0.65% of starters will suffer bleeding from the nose or epistaxis during a race or immediately afterwards. And that's in line with most other jurisdictions globally. We are able to make a very um, reasonable estimation, if, if not an accurate calculation of the uh, proportion of the entire population that will bleed at some stage in their career, and that's 3.9%. This data is average over the last five years. So of the entire population of horses, 3.9% of those will bleed at some stage in their career. And 0.06% of horses are forced to retire through the three-bleed compulsory retirement rule. And the median number of starts before a horse is recorded as a bleeder is 16. So that just sets the scene for Hong Kong um, and provides some information of, um, of a jurisdiction, albeit a, um, a, 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 an unusual one compared to most places where, where um, there are private veterinarians, etc., but where Lasix is not permitted in racing or training. Thank you, Chris. Um, just as a quick wrap up then, uh, and you've given us a terrific briefing of your, of your context in which you work. Can you tell me um, you know, what you believe to be the appropriate uh, way to manage EIPH in your environment? <clears throat> well, we, we focus on uh, the best we can to maintain respiratory health in terms of um, managing physical obstruction to the upper respiratory tract in terms of trying to manage roarers or horses with dorsal displacement of the soft palate as effectively and as promptly as we can. Um, we also scope on a regular basis looking for evidence of inflammatory airway disease and put great emphasis on trying to manage that. Um, so that's our, our main focus. We don't have any magic, magic medications or anything that we can use to prophylactically prevent it or to treat it. I also am assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're racing on the turf in Hong Kong? Uh, in the most 88, sorry, I should have said yes. 88% of our races are on turf. And um, the remaining 12% are on um, a dirt track. Okay, thank you. Well, I appreciate that very much. We'd like to, I'd like to go down through the list of our, our participants now and uh, hear from everyone. So the next step will be for uh, Jeff Blay to give us his comments about his experience in managing EIPH and his practice and his views on the use of, of Lasix or any other means to uh, control EIPH in the racehorse. Jeff? Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here, uh, even though it's over the phone. I do have a question for Dr. Riggs, if I might, before we start. Um, why is there a reluctance in Hong Kong to not train on LASIKs? There are several reasons for that. Um, a main one would be that the whole Hong Kong model relies on complete transparency to the uh, to our customers um, and we want the people who are going to bet on our races to have as much information as possible including um, any factor that might influence a horse in its race so there's always been a, a, a belief that training a horse on, on Lasix might have an effect on its performance in training that then may not be reflected truthfully when the horse races. 
So that would be a significant reason for it. There are also other concerns <clears throat> about, um, which no doubt will come up in discussion, but the concerns of uh, uh, Lasix masking a potential use of other prohibited substances. We also have some Great, concerns about uh, using a diuretic and effects on electrolyte concentrations and things like that. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. So here in Southern California, um, we treat deers not only in the morning but in the afternoon. Um, AAP supports the use of Lasix based on the efficacy as presented in data, most notably in Hinchcliffe's work in 2009. So I'm a, I'm a proponent of Lasix. However, uh, we all know this has become one of the most polarizing issues in the industry. In my introduction, when Lee was reading it, uh, he mentioned four racetracks that I work at. Well, in this, as of today, two of those racetracks are now closed. So the fact that it's the industry is uh, going through a lot of changes. I think our, our mission ought to be to try and figure out this LASIK issue the best way we can, not only for the horse, but for the industry in order for it to survive and thrive again. So what I noticed on my end is a lot of trainers treat horses free in the morning with LASIKs. Uh, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. Uh, some of them will treat them an hour out two hours, three hours, four hours. Um, it's become very common uh, in the last 10 years, I think, for trainers to treat a lot of workers in the mornings. Uh, I think it helps keep a schedule uh, as far as pointing for a certain race. We have a fair number of clients now, maybe a handful, that request no late six in the morning and no late six on race day unless until they've been a proven leader, and I'll use a grade three or grade four before suggesting to the trainer that we put the horse on Lasix or talking to the owner. Um, I think Lasix is a very therapeutic drug for EIPH. Unfortunately, I don't think it's probably the best medication out there, uh, but it's the best we have currently. Um, and that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is there, and I, I didn't hear Dr. Sweeney and Morley talk earlier, and maybe they talked about this better than I can, but there hasn't been a tremendous amount of research done on EIPH in the last 20 years. There's been a few papers in the last five to 10, but not a whole lot. So I think as a practitioner, you know, Lasix is the best we have to treat EIPH, which essentially is a disease, and if you go through the AC Grand consensus paper, they recommend, the College of Internal Medicine specialists recommend that EIPH be classified as a disease. And now that we're, faced, we're dealing with a disease, we have to have some sort of therapy to treat it. And the best we have is furosemide. Well, I think we can do better than that as scientists and as an industry. And the first step is, you know, the question with this whole debate is we don't know what we don't know. How heritable is it? We don't know. Uh, what is known about the current pathophysiology of EIPH? There's some information out there, but I don't think we know enough about it. Uh, how effective is Lasix? According to Hinchcliffe's paper in 09, it's, it's effective, but it's not 100% reliable. So I think there's a lot more research that needs to be done to glean some of these important details. Um, are there any other potential treatment options available out there to treat, to treat the IPH that we don't know about or that haven't been studied or looked at? Um, are they feasible? Uh, are they practical? Is it something that can be done? So <clears throat> the, the point being is I think in, with the IPH, there's a lot of things we don't know that we need to start looking at. And in order to answer the questions, we have to start asking the questions. And I think there's, there's a push to do that now uh, until we come up with the right questions and the right answers. I think LASIK is the most effective treatment I have in 
my hands. Um, I also think EIPH is a function of two other things related to the industry, one being pedigrees or breeding. Secondly, I think it's related to training and management. Uh, I know some trainers that tend to have far less, quote unquote, breeders and a, a different style of training, but they'll have to ask their opinion on that rather than mine. But I do think training and management plays a major role in EIPH um, and, and helping to control EIPH. So I think that's part of it as well. So as an industry, I think we need to focus on looking at other alternatives, uh, methods of treating EIPH, not only from a therapeutic or pharmacological standpoint, but a management and breeding standpoint. If you told me today uh, on Wednesday's card, Del Mar tomorrow, there'll be no Lasix on race day. I'd say, okay, I'm not going to go stand in the paddock with a picket sign and say, stop this, this heresy, stop it now. I think we all have to start changing our way of thinking. I think we need to start being a little more progressive in how we look at this disease and how we manage it. And if we can come up with some solutions in the future to not only take care of the horse that's racing, but also support the, the industry, I think everybody wins. Thank you, Jeff. Next, I'd like to hear from Gary Priest. Gary, would you share your thoughts with us on the use of LASIKs in your practice and how you think we ought to be doing it? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the honor of being a, a member of this group. Um, I learned a tremendous amount listening to uh, Dr. Riggs and to Dr. Bly just now. You know, I thought it was, um, I guess my focus is, and I've made this statement that I think got published, that I thought it was the most abused truck drug on the racetrack, and I think Jeff just kind of backed up what I was saying. I, my concern initially in getting involved in this was that there are so many horses that are treated uh, on every work day, every race day. They end up getting treated for with Lasix, um, you know, several times in a month. And the effect that Lasix has on electrolyte balance and hydration and stuff, I think uh, there are definitely some some untoward side effects. I also am concerned as, and in reading Dr. Morley's work and others, you know, I'm not sure we completely understand why Lasix um, is effective or, in fact, even if it's as effective as we think it is. I know I was reading just the other day and some work that Dr. Morley did, I believe, in 2009, <clears throat> where they made uh, mention of how the cilia um, in the bronchioles and stuff are affected by Lasix. And, in fact, maybe the horses may not, I don't know what's is correct here. I, I, I certainly don't pretend to know the answer to this question, but maybe what we think is apparent benefit from Lasix, maybe we just don't visualize uh, on the endoscopic exam, the hemorrhage, uh, that we would visualize um, in a horse that didn't receive Lasix. So, I don't know. I, I don't know that I have much to add to this elite group other than to say I think that the number of horses that are treated on a daily basis at the track with Lasix um, just seems to be quite excessive when the side effects of that treatment seem to me to be detrimental to the horse's overall health. And, and one thing I would comment, too, I thought it was really interesting that Dr. Riggs was, and, and I have a particular interest in upper airway uh, obstructions, and I thought it was very interesting in Hong Kong that they, you know, thoroughly evaluate the upper airway function in these horses that do bleed, uh, it, because I believe there is, at least in my, in my observation, oftentimes horses that are considered to be significant bleeders have a secondary or maybe it's the primary problem of upper airway obstruction. That's about all I have right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Gary. Foster, would you care to share with us your feelings and how you manage EIPH in your horse population? And as a racing commissioner in Kentucky, what do you think about the use of EIPH and how to best regulate it? Well, I've always been from the school that um, 
what's best for the horse is best for the industry. Uh, I still think that horses lead uh, and that we need Lasix uh, as racing is conducted in this country. Um, you know, I think there's another part of this that, that's kind of being lost here, and that is of the owners and the expense that, that we are all facing as veterinarians and trainers. Uh, we're, we're, we're in a different environment uh, where owners are crossing their T's and dotting their I's, and they don't want vet bills, and they don't want, uh, they don't want a lot of expenses. And uh, as far as, as, as a lot of research and a lot of, a lot of extras, uh, scopings and extra vet procedures, I think it's going to be realistically in certain circles not possible. So I think that needs to be considered uh, as we move forward as an industry trying to figure a solution to this this issue. Um, I, I, for one, I, I'm very simplistic the way I look at it. Uh, Latex is the only is the only drug we have that shows some effect to prevent. Uh, EIPH. Uh, I know Dr. Uh, Priest was talking about the, the, the dangers of overuse, and I respect Dr. Priest a lot. I like him a lot. As a practitioner, I'm not seeing that. Now, maybe I'm blessed in that I have a clientele that, that doesn't overuse the drug. But, but so I'm not seeing the dire side effects that a lot of people uh, talk about uh, seeing. Uh, what I do see is, is the push to use, with, with uh, more restrictions, the, the, the push is to, to use all this, these garbage adjuncts that, that people want to pull out. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to get back to the garbage adjuncts and withholding water and hay for 24 hours. Uh, it, this all scares me. Uh, do I want something better than LASIK? Absolutely. Uh, do I want something that wouldn't be... On performance day, of course I would. That would be nice. But, but I think racing is, is held to a, an unfair standard in that uh, the claim is we're the only sport out there that allows uh, this drug on, on performance day when, when that's just simply not true. Uh, you know, most sports allow certain medications uh, on performance day, including you know, I'm an asthmatic, and I can relate to breathing from the standpoint I know what it feels like when I can't breathe. And, you know, playing sports and trying to perform at my best and not be able to breathe, uh, it was pretty miserable. And I think it's important to note that even in the Olympics, you know, their drug exemptions, you know, an athlete can actually perform with uh, a level of albuterol. It's strictly controlled it. So that's what we do with LASIK. We strictly control it. Uh, so I, I, I'm all for something better. Uh, I'm not for taking LASIK from horses at this at this moment in time in this country. Uh, important our horses as healthy as possible, and I think LASIK helps me manage uh, bleeders uh, a lot more economically and easily and better, as far as I'm concerned. Than, than not using it. And I think I'm talking in circles, so I'll be quiet. I hope I made my point. Well, I think you did, Foster. Thank you. Uh, Greg, could you please uh, give us your insight, please, into your experience in California and how you feel about the use of Lasix and racehorses? Yes, I'd be happy to. Again, I thank the committee for inviting me to speak. Uh, since I'm one of the few dinosaurs that existed before uh, the EIPH was uh, existed, or the um, or the use of Lasix existed. Maybe I can give you a little historical perspective that might shed some light on what we're talking about today. Before the advent of the fiber optic endoscope, uh, exercise induced pulmonary hemorrhage was a non-existent disease. Uh, most everyone thought that horses that bled bled from the nostrils, epistaxis. The incidence of Epistaxis uh, pretty much throughout the country was less than 5%. And the way it was diagnosed is that uh, trainers or grooms would see a small trickle of blood in the nostril once the horse returned to the stall and lowered his head to eat. 
the incidence of horses that actually bled from the nostrils on the track in those days was probably less than 2%. Uh, and those horses were generally rested since a period of time and treated medically. Uh, the other horses, it was a management issue. Trainers trained slightly differently, managed them slightly differently. differently. But overall, the um, leaders were not a big issue. It wasn't until a few of us brought the fiber optic endoscope onto the track, started scoping horses that allowed us to scope horses immediately after racing or working, that we began to see blood in the airway. Uh, because of that, uh, we started a study in California with uh, Dr. John Pasco uh, that uh, to scope horses after racing uh, to see what the incidence was. Uh, those scopings took place in the receiving barn, so it was horses that were winners and horses that were brought in for testing for other reasons. At that time, Dr. Pasco's study throughout the United States, California, uh, most all the major racing states, showed the incidence of bleeding to be about 40%. And that was very consistent throughout the U.S. I think that study, as I recall, was followed up by people at the University of Pennsylvania, and the results were pretty consistent with what we found. So the argument was made, and I was one of the ones that made the argument for the California Horse Racing Board that we had a, this problem, exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage, as we defined it. Uh, we needed some way to treat it, and Lasix was the only option that we had at that time. Uh, the argument was made before the CHRB that if you would just let us use Lasix, um, our research would continue, and we would find a better solution, and Lasix would only be a temporary solution. The problem was that once Lasix was permitted on the on racing, that the money for research into um, into EIPH just dried up, and so essentially, as uh, Dr. Blair mentioned, I think uh, there has been no significant research on uh, on EIPH in the last uh, two three decades, which is a real shame, and that leads us to where we are today. Um, in this controversy. The second thing I think is important is once the decision was made to put the use of Lasix in the program, in other words, identify those horses that were on Lasix, uh, we made the argument that they, this was a mistake that it would lead to increased use of Lasix on race day. The, uh, the counter argument was no, because horses had to be proven bleeders, et cetera, et cetera in order to use Lasix, that this wouldn't become a problem. But the fact is that within two to three months post uh, the indication of bleeders in the program, almost every horse in every race uh, was on Lasix. So I think that led to the excessive use, that decision, um, and that's been a consistent problem uh, since that time. Now, in terms of my own opinions and observations. I always felt that we could divide horses that suffered from respiratory bleeding into two categories. Those that were basically physiological bleeders, those are the ones, twos, and threes on our scale. And those horses, because of the dynamic of the lung, the, the amount of air that's being moved through the lung, the great expansion and contraction of the lung, plus the horse's stride, led to leakage of blood through the, out of the capillaries into the airways and, and was observed with the endoscope. I don't think those horses are a problem. I think that's a natural phenomenon uh, that goes along with uh, excessive exertion. If you talk to uh, super marathoners and marathon runners, they will also tell you at times that they taste blood uh, while they're running. Now, the second group is what we would call pathological bleeders. Those horses actually have a lesion in their lung. You can identify it with radiographs or other imaging techniques. Those horses, uh, they need more than Lasix. Lasix isn't going to solve their problem. And those horses need extensive rest and medical therapy. 
and uh, Lasix is is a non-performance there. I believe personally that Lasix is not that effective against the physiological bleeder, but that it is a performance enhancing drug because it's a mild bronchodilator and that allows horses to perform better on it. Now, those are my personal opinions. The one perspective I can give you uh, based on my uh, tenure as a director of the Center for Equine Health, in which I was dealing with all aspects of horse, race, of horse industry, not just racing. The rest of the horse world is extremely healthy. It's growing very rapidly. It's doing quite well. It's only thoroughbred racing that is declining. And from the public's perception, whether we believe in Lasix or we don't believe in Lasix, the public doesn't want it. And it's hurting our industry and hurting our game. So uh, regardless of our opinion, if we continue down the path we're, we've chosen, I believe that we'll eventually erode our fan base and, and have some serious problems in that regard. That's about all I have to present. Thank you, Greg. Scott, would you go ahead and share with us your feelings about uh, how you work with Lasix in your practice and manage EIPH? Uh, is there a reason why you left me so last? Yeah, because I couldn't remember your first name. <laughs> um, thank you, Scott. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, to put this, uh, at least in my practice, in a little bit of perspective, I, I basically deal with musculoskeletal issues and respiratory issues. And I'd say it's split right down the middle on uh, a frequency. Um, those respiratory issues are divided amongst uh, infectious issues, inflammatory airway issues, upper respiratory issues, uh, obstruction type things, and EIPH. So it's not just a little part of our practice. It's not 2 or 3% of our practice. It's a big chunk of what we do dealing with this problem. Um, I agree with um, you know, Dr. Blay and Dr. Northrup that it is at least currently our most effective way of Lasix or furosemide is the most effective way of dealing with the IPH issues we have um, over the years. There's certainly been a lot of other things that have come and gone. Um, horsemen and veterinarians are, are in a kind of a difficult situation when they get horses that are bleeding and uh, affecting their performance. To, to try to control that, and so therefore at least to some almost level of desperation to find something, particularly on those bad bleeders, that will help them. And, and, and getting them out of the racing population is one option, but it's not a very good option if you own that horse. So we're, we're confronted with horses all the time that we're attempting to be able to control them. And so, you know, as, as things to circle around over time, we find a lot of things that don't help very much. We find a lot of things that anecdotally we think do help. And the Lasix has probably been the one thing that stood the test of time as, as far as being our most efficacious tool out there. Now, that being said, I certainly have a lot of trouble controlling horses with the IPH with Lasix alone. Uh, certain individuals are very problematic and you find that after trying multiple management strategies, uh, multiple rest periods, multiple medication strategies, that you still have problems. So I'm with the guys that are saying we need more research. We need more knowledge. We certainly, and AAP came out recently with uh, a 10-point prescription for reform, and two of those points involved uh, furosemide. And the big one was we need to look further and deeper. A ACVI consensus paper that came out um, certainly indicated that there was A, little research, and B, little effective medications out there to control the problem. Um, and, it, you know, and it did confirm that it is a significant problem. Uh, but the, the fact that it remains that Lasix isn't totally efficacious, <laughs> Uh, although it's the best we've got. So we're trying to, you know, 
prod the industry a little bit to find other things. If we really 